Welcome everybody. Uh, give us a few minutes. We are actually pretty early as I can tell. Uh, we're about five minutes early, so we'll be hanging out. Um, I'll probably just leave this image up for a little while until we get going. Just wanted to say hi. Hey, John. Yeah, I wasn't looking at my phone and uh, apparently I'm five minutes early. Hey, Jonathan. So is anyone getting out and fishing lately? Ah, that's not fun. Come on, you gotta get out and fish. I will say, uh, Brian and I were out on Friday on a uh, unnamed brook trout stream that uh, wasn't really worth it. But, you know, we still had fun. Um, absolutely beautiful out there right now. It is gorgeous. And uh, we had a good time. Didn't catch a whole lot. Pictures that I'm seeing with brook trout, though, uh, looks like they're starting to put on their um, makeup for going out to the uh, big dance. And uh, I got a feeling they're going to be uh, kind of getting ready to spawn any day now. They're starting to get ready to go out and uh, have some fun for the night. So that's kind of sad, but at the same time, a good thing, because that means that 90 days, uh, we'll give it 120 days. Or so, you know, basically mid-February, we'll be able to start getting back out to them. Yeah, the uh, the reservoir, I expect to start slowing down a little bit, John. With um, with the fact that everything's cooling off, I fully would expect for, like, the reservoir to be slowing down a bit. Hold on. Let's... I don't know if that helped any or not. I just had to flip something around on my camera. Yeah, 62. Eh, bass should still be moving, but they're probably going to be moving down to that deep water getting ready for winter. You know, they want to be ready for that winter time. Yeah, so here's the phone one. I, guys, don't... I've got to turn on my phone in order to have a clock right now, so... Yeah. We're going to have some fun tonight. We're going to tie up, tie up the pheasant tail, and I'll go into it a bit more when I really get going. Um, cool fly. I learned some history on it. Yeah, it is. Yep, this is a picture of the finished fly. I always like to start out with a picture of the finished fly, and actually this is one that uh, got used on Friday. Um, as you can tell, it didn't get chewed up very much, so that's not a good thing. But yeah, it's just a picture of the finished fly. We're going to get going in a little bit. Like I said, I kind of got started a little bit early today because I, yeah, apparently getting set up was a little quicker today. I'm actually, if anybody can tell, I'm on a new setup. Um, I'm actually going to try to tie, and this is totally an attempt, guys. If this doesn't work, let me know. Feel free to tell me. Um, I'm actually going to tie with the camera between me and the fly. So you won't see me, you won't see my hand movements. Like, normally you guys can see my hands moving. Uh, that's actually the wall in the background. So, if this doesn't work tonight, let me know. I'll, uh, I'll change up. I just wanted to try this tonight. I don't know. Does anybody know if Brian's gotten on? So yeah, with tonight's fly, pretty simple, um, pheasant tail, classic fly. But uh, I'm going to go into some interesting things I learned with that being classic. All right, well, 
It is now 6.30. It is time to get going. So welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Orbis Charlottesville, not the Orbis, wow, that goes back a long way, to the Project Healing Water Charlottesville live stream. Uh, I'm Jeff. I'm going to be tying tonight, and uh, we're going to be tying the pheasant tail nymph. So we talked about this being a classic, and something I learned, I thought this fly was old, was really old. I assumed this fly was early 1900s, and it turns out that it is not. It actually, this fly was developed in 1956. So it's not really old, at least not in my book. Um, you know, it's not young. It wasn't developed last year, but it's still a pretty good fly. So the cool thing with this fly, and where's my box I need to show off, is to talk about it. It's called a pheasant tail for a reason. This part's pheasant tail, this part's pheasant tail. This part up here, I'm going to flip it around. Normally, this is actually also pheasant tail. Um, I tie mine a little bit differently. Wow, that is not centered. Um, but I also like to tie mine a little bit differently. I like to use turkey for that. Um, why do I use turkey? I think it just makes for a better looking fly. And honestly, I really should have my dad teaching you guys how to tie this fly. Just because of the fact that my dad actually is a pheasant tail master. He has probably tied more pheasant tails, honestly, than I've tied a lot of things. He loves to tie the pheasant tail. He'll tie it small. Um, this fly you're seeing right here, this is a size 10. So this is a fairly large pheasant tail. Typically, size 8 is about as big as you go. Um, my dad likes to tie it down to an 18. Um, personally, I've tied it down to a 24. Um, but that was more on a bet than anything. I would never purposefully tie it a pheasant tail on a 24. Um, I did win the bet, by the way, which is awesome. So, but yeah, this is a pretty basic fly. I'll start out. What you're going to use is a standard nymph hook. I'm actually using a little bit different hook tonight. I'm using the Orvis Tactical Barbless um, heavyweight hook. And focus. There we go. Um, so this is just the hook I like to use for this fly. Literally picked these things up today. Uh, ran into ran into my local Orvis store to pick them up. So it uses pheasant tail, your standard pheasant tail, um, general material, peacock curl. I'm using a strung peacock curl. Now, if you notice on this one, if you're looking at it, that doesn't look like normal peacock curl. That is actually dubbing. That is peacock dubbing. Um, to be honest, when I was tying these up, be able to do a uh, type of few for you guys to have a picture. I was out of peacock curl, so I had to quick make a substitution. Went to my peacock dubbing. I like peacock dubbing for a lot of reasons. It is a little tougher. Um, it's a little more durable of a material, but that's about the only real reason to go to it. So let's get going with this fly. Take that off. So there is a bead on this fly. Tonight I'm going to use on this size ten a one eighth inch bead. In gold, one eighth's a little bit smaller than you typically would use on a ten. I'm not trying to make a super heavy fly. I'm gonna actually try to tie this one up to be a little bit lighter. And I just dropped that one on the floor. Let's see if I can find it. There we go. If you're not dropping beads on the floor, you're not doing it right. So as we remember, Brian talked about this a few weeks ago, and I'm gonna have nothing on the with a bead. Oh, that doesn't help. There is a small hole let me try to flip it around and get it so you guys can actually see and that is not at all showing up this is really difficult guys i'm sorry and a large hole so when we're putting a bead on i want to put the point of the hook through now i gotta find it through the small hole you want that large hole to be towards the back and what that'll allow the fly to do is to sit right up on the eye of the hook. Let that bead sit right up on the eye of the hook. And as you can tell, it's a pretty small bead. Um, typically, you'd want to go to like, uh, I'm trying to remember what size it is. I am horrible with my sizes on beads. That's the reason why I got this handy dandy little cheat sheet. Was it a 630? No, it can't be. I don't know. One six, I think it's 1 16th. No, no, it can't be 1 16th. I don't know. Go up a size from 1 8th, typically. So with this fly, I'm going to be using just plain old black thread, a dot. Now if you notice, I put the fly in going downhill a little bit to help me out. Yep, 
always substitute. Hey guys, that's the reason why on my uh, one that I did, I, I had to substitute. And uh, you want to substitute with a different material at that little spot, feel free. Um, this fly is a classic, but there's also a billion ways to tie it. This is how I tie it. Um, this is not the way even my dad ties it. This is not the way that, you know, is official in the books. This is how I like to tie it. So we're going to start our thread. I always like to start right behind the eye of the hook. Wrap back. Find your scissors on the table. Forget that you uh, realize you forgot to put the trash can right at your feet. So we're going to wrap back to the bend of the hook. We're going to wrap forward. Now, one, one thing I'm doing there is I'm just trying to put down a thread base. What I want the thread base for is for my ultra wire. So I'm going to use medium copper tonight. And as you can tell on my spool, I think I need to go to a fly shop and pick up more. I should have picked that up today when I was out. Um, so don't need very much. I'm going to grab probably about five, six inches. This does not want to break. So I am going to be a bad boy. Use a pair of scissors. One thing I like to do is I like to break off a section. Um, not the most efficient way. Honestly, if you were to use a, uh, keep it on the, keep it on the spool, you'd go through less, but I, I'm weird like that. But one thing I like to do is I like to put the wire right into the eye the, or right into that back of that bead. And I'm going to use that to help create a little bit of a body. So I'm going to go to the back. I'm going to leave that right there for right now. Now I'm going to come on to my, come and grab my pheasant tail. Because this is a size 10, so this is a pretty big one, I'm going to grab a pretty good sized chunk of pheasant tail. Maybe 10 to a dozen fibers and rip them off. Now one thing I did is I tried to pull them straight so you get kind of a fairly straight section of tails. I do like to have a little bit of taper because nothing in nature is perfectly straight cut. And I probably should talk about what this fly imitates before I tie in the tail. This fly imitates everything. Um, so if you wanted to tie it with a longer tail, let's say, it'd look more like a little mayfly. If you want to tie it with a shorter tail, it might look like a little stonefly. For a smaller fly, I mean, depending, it really kind of depends, Brian. Um, like this one I said, it probably had 10 or 12 pieces. Um, you know, go down to two if you're doing like an 18 or a 20. You know, if you're doing the small ones. So really, and that's one other thing is, is that when you're also trying to think of what you might want to imitate. My dad, typically when he's tying these things, he's tying them in black and he's trying to imitate little stoneflies. So he's going to actually use a bit more material bit more tails than what you normally would use for a mayfly. Mayflies are very skinny. Um, they've got a very little waist that goes all the way back. Um, big thorax, so kind of, you know, big chest area, and then little tiny waist going all the way back. Stoneflies, on the other hand, are just kind of fat all the way down. Um, kind of what they are. But that's kind of the cool thing with stoneflies. So it's kind of also what you want to imitate. And when they say this fly can imitate everything, I'm not saying if you tied it with a fat body and Fish see mayflies, they're, they're going to go, oh, that's a stonefly. No, they ain't that smart. Um, I can tell you that I do think that they're smarter than me some days. But yeah, so right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie this, and I'm going to tie it with a tail about the length of the body. Kind of got lucky there. Um, literally just playing around, having to catch about the right length. So that's the goal. I always, if you've ever seen me work, I always do right hand, measure it out, switch over to left hand, tie in. And now... One thing we want to do when we're tying in, we do not tie forward. We do about three wraps, three good tight wraps, maybe four, five, and we stop. So there's a reason for this, because we're going to use this section for the body. It's kind of a cool thing with this fly um, is that the tail and the body are made out of the same material. So now we're going to pick the Pick this up, and we're going to move up to, I usually like to ha have about a third left of the hook behind. 
And then what I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna wrap. And this can be fun to try to wrap. Yep. So you wanna catch all the fibers. It's gonna be a little fatter of a body. And that's kind of what I wanted. And then because of the fact that I've got so many fibers, I didn't have to bake very many wraps forward. All right, so four wraps to hold down. Um, if anybody's ever spent enough time with me, you realize that I like to do four wraps to hold stuff down. Don't ask me why, it's just what I do. So normally, you're gonna use this material to do the wing case, so that top part that went over, you would then wrap it back. Since I don't like to do that, I'm gonna cut this off. You wanna leave, if you wanna uh, use this material and literally just do a fly with just this, you can. Um, that would be the traditional way. I am, as most people know, at not traditional. I'm gonna cut it off, put it down into my little trash area. So, now I'm gonna take the wire and I'm actually gonna counter wrap. So if you remember, I was going clockwise. Yeah, that's clockwise. So now I'm gonna go counterclockwise. And the reason for this wrap is one, creates a segmented look. That's the first reason. Two, pheasant tail is not known for its durability. Um, there we go. Helicopter off. Um, so one thing I did there is I just went and wrapped around. I start, I pulled up and was just kind of spinning it around. Eventually you will break it. You'll break your wire. It's called helicoptering off. Wrap down. Now, we're going to pull out our strung peacock curl. Good luck getting it out of a fresh batch out of the bag. Literally, guys, at 3 o'clock this afternoon, I was sitting in a, sh in a store picking up, picking up materials for this. And now I am going to grab, because I'm doing a size 10 and I'm doing something a little bit bigger, I'm going to grab four. For a, smaller, for a smaller one that we're tying, I would maybe grab three or two or even one if you're doing a real small one. When you're doing smaller... Obviously you need less material. I decided on three this time because I'm kind of feeling frisky like that. So put the material down, wrap it in, try to make sure you catch all the hairs. Pull it off to the side. And one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to have it off, I'm heading towards the back with it. And that's just because the fact that it's getting it out of my way. So the next material I am personally gonna use is malted turkey. Standard stuff, if you know a turkey hunter, you can get literally about 14 lifetime supplies off of one turkey tail. So, now for this fly, because it's a size 10, you can actually kind of see, I cut a pretty good size section out. It's about an eighth of an inch. So, I would actually do that again. Just take my scissors, cut it. Pull it out, try to make sure everything stays in line. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna tie this in upside down. So if you notice, there's a dull side and a, well, kind of not quite as dull side. So what you wanna do is you wanna tie it in with the dull side facing up. I'm gonna straighten up that cut because it's on an angle. Tie back, now make sure we get the bobbin all the way up to the eye this time. We kind of want to be able to get everything because everything's going to finish up right behind the eye of this fly. So, this is peacock curl. It is not the strongest material ever. Give it some twists. Twist it all together so that theoretically, when you catch fish with it, it's not going to end up being broken. One reason to use multiple is 
And then I've got extra sitting here. Trim that off. Save this for the next fly. I mean, because this is the kind of fly you're going to tie up multiple of them. So now, what we've got, if you look, a fly with a really big wing. Yeah, no, we don't want that. What we're going to do is we're going to take this piece of turkey, fold it over the top. What that creates, we're going to do one wrap just to kind of hold it for a moment. What that creates on this fly is called a wing case. I don't like the fact that it kind of flattened out so much. You kind of want to look at it and create that. So what that looks like is on a nymph. Brian, actually you could wrap the thread around the peacock curl. That's one technique that I sometimes use on pheasant tails. I don't use it as much because you're doing such a short section. Um, if you're doing something like a prince nymph, oh, by all means, a, something that's whole body is peacock curl. But no, but what I was getting back to is looking at this, what this little section right here is called, it's called a wing case. These pretty much all insects that are flying insect underwater, when they're flying, once they become adults, they've got basically proto wings. And there's a little case over top of them when they're a nymph. Well, that is actually something that trout key in on. Um, and mayflies typically have only one case. Uh, stoneflies actually will have, for some reason, it looks like three, even though they only have two wings. Um, you know, but mayflies, this is kind of just what you do for a mayfly, and this just looks like a big brown mayfly. Currently. We're going to do a couple wraps to hold it down. Trim off. Save your extra, because you'll need it for the next fly. But yeah, just looking at it, I mean, this is a pretty basic fly. There isn't a whole lot to it. Um, cool thing with this fly, and that's one of the reasons why I love it, is it is basic. It's also very effective. Um, there's a reason why it's called a classic already. It's because of the fact that it is just that effective. This fly, tied up big, will catch a bass. Um, even, you know, it'll look like a, uh, you know, like a mayfly, or not a mayfly, a uh, damselfly nymph. It'll definitely catch a bluegill. I mean, honestly, if bluegill are really biting, what won't catch a bluegill? But, you know, bluegill, bass, obviously trout is kind of what we're tying it for. Um, we're kind of in that trout mindset because, you know, as John and Stu were out earlier, you know, and talked about the... Uh, river or sorry the reservoir being at 62 degrees it's starting to get a little starting to get a little colder for bass um now we're starting to think towards trout i was out last week with brian for him had a good photography trip so now we're gonna whip finish you can't whip finish don't worry you can half hitch that's just fine i'm gonna do a f i don't know was that five turns Hold tight, make sure I feel that little pop as it comes tight. So one thing you could do with this fly, I'm using black thread. What if you used red thread? And you can actually see where my thread is sitting. What if you used red thread and created a little hot spot? That is a cool little thing you can do to help make your fly a little bit different. And hot spots are a popular thing in trout fishing. Um, they're great. The next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to make this fly a little bit more durable. I've got my Sally Hansen's hard as nails. If you've got, if you've got uh, epoxy, you know, if you've got a little bit of, the, of a UV epoxy, you could definitely do. But I'm going to go over top of that malted turkey. I'm going to create a little, just basically try to cover that up. Hopefully it'll soak down into the peacock curl a little bit. But the cool thing with peacock curl is if you watch as this fly goes around, see how it's iridescent? That helps to attract fish. Now, why peacock curl? Uh, red wire, absolutely you could use red wire. Um, there's nothing wrong with using red wire. Then it's just a red wire pheasant tail. So the cool thing with the pheasant tail, whatever you do to it, you can kind of name it your own name. Um, thus, you know, you can kind of make it your own. 
Nothing wrong with using red wire. I happen to have copper. That's the only reason why I used copper tonight was honestly, and you can see how much copper I've got left. I'm getting low on wire. I'm gonna have to go and do a purchase of wire. Um, that means I gotta make another trip out. Oh well. Um, but yeah, copper wire, gold wire, black wire, red wire, chartreuse wire. Think about that one. Um, any color of wire you've got. Nothing wrong with it. But, cool thing is, that's the fly done. So it's a really simple fly. Really a basic, this is a classic that, you know, everybody, in my opinion, should learn, even if they don't really want to tie it very often, just because it's a fly that we should know. And like I said, my dad ties a million of these things. Um, truly, whenever he's going on any trip, I swear, first thing he does is he sits down and ties up another dozen of them. And I'm just kind of thinking like, Dad, you went through like three of them last trip. Why are you tying up another dozen? So, well, there's the first one done. Now, I'm going to do a little variation on this fly for my second one tonight. Um, hope you guys don't mind. Kind of am in the mood to. So, you can tie it up exactly the same way we just did. I'm going to put in a little variation that I've been kind of thinking about for a while. I am going to do a little bit bigger bead. As you guys can hear, I've got a little, I got a little box of beads. Um, and years ago, I wrote down sizes on the back. And it's wearing off. I need to redo it. Um... This is a great little tip for anybody. Literally, I picked up this box at a fly shop. It had some of the it had some of the beads in it. I just truly went and bought more beads or took ones that I had. I've got, you know, silver mixed with gold mixed with, you know, mixed with black beads. Like, it doesn't matter to me. Um, but I'm going to go up to the next size up that I've got, which is going to be a little bit heavy of a fly. That's fine. What I'm going to do to it. So, this one should be a little easier to be able to see. Small hole. Trying to be able to get it to spin around. Larger hole. So we always want to go small hole in. If you ever go the wrong way, you'll know it pretty quick because the fly will, the bead will sit actually over top of the eye. If you ever use way too big of a bead, the bead will actually sit over top of the eye. So if I were to go to the big monster beads that I've got, it wouldn't even fit on. It would just slide right off the end. So putting it in, as you can see, that's a much bigger bead. So one thing that bigger bead's gonna cause, I'm gonna have a shorter body. Something to think about when you're doing your beads and something to think about with, these, with your hooks. I With this hook that I chose, it's a pretty short shanked hook. It's also got a really big gap in it. Um, that's the reason why I like it. It's also barbless, which I like. Um, it's also wicked sharp, which I like. And it's got a lot of things that are going for it for me. So, first thing we got to do is clean off our desk a little bit. Make some room to do this. So just tying in our thread, grab our scissors, cut it off. So now, I'm gonna wrap back. And one thing, one of the reasons why I'm putting down that thread base is it keeps materials from spinning on the hook when they shouldn't be. I'm gonna grab our copper wire. And one thing also, guys, you don't have to use a bead on this fly. Um, I guess I probably should have demonstrated it without, but I've always tied it with a bead. Um, I don't know if I could really even tie this fly without a bead because I literally have always tied it with a bead. Um, and this is the more simplified version. There is what's called the, I'm trying to remember, that is the English version of the fly. It actually has got legs. Um, so what they do is they actually take the pheasant tail and they fold it forward and then they fold it back and it creates like legs. And while it works, to me it's more work and it's more to catch the fisherman especially the fisherman in the fly shop, than it is to catch the fish. Just one of my things that I have a hard time dealing with is whenever I see a fly that is designed to catch fishermen, not fish. I don't like that concept. 
if a fly is tied, it should be tied to catch fish. So grab our pheasant tail, you know, grab, you know, if you're doing this in like a, let's say a size 14, I would grab about eight fibers. Um, you're doing this in a, you know, in an 18, grab six or five, you know, grab fewer. If you're doing this in a 22, good luck. Doing this in a 24, you're crazy. Like I said, I did it once for a bet. And yes, I won the bet. But I said I would never do it again. You need to tie that thread just a little bit further back. I want to get it right around the bend of the hook. So for this one, I'm actually going to go for a little shorter of a tail. Okay. So if you look, I got a shorter tail on this one. Why is that? Eh, I feel like a shorter tail on this one. It's also because of the fact that with this one, with what I do at the end, this fly is, well, it's going to be fishing down, and this is a nip, so it should be fished down near the bottom. Um, one of the reasons why I always tell people, like, whenever you tie nymphs, you should always tie up a couple of them, because if you're not losing nymphs, you're not fishing them in the right place. Should be fishing nymphs down on the bottom, but this one's going to be tied a little different. It's still technically a nymph, but it's going to have some, a little cool factor to it. So now wrap our thread to the front. We're going to go back about a third. Apparently I did not get all the fibers mixed in, as you can tell. Oh well. One. Tie down that. I feel like I got a short little body, a short and fat body. What that tells me, tells me stonefly, personally. Um, if you know me, you know I love stoneflies. I've got a thing for them. Um, don't ask me why. I think they're one of the coolest bugs in the river. One of the reasons I will say that, they're, that I do love them is if you ever find stoneflies in the river, you know you're in a very clean river. Um, they are actually an indicator species of cleanliness to a river. Mayflies will take some will take some uh, pollution. Caddisflies will take a lot of pollution. Stoneflies, if you've got pretty much any pollution, done. They will not be around. So for me, that's one reason why I love them. It's because of the fact that they indicate to me I'm in clean water. And sometimes finding that, it's not always something we find. So if I ever flip over a rock and see a stonefly, you'll see me get giddy. Because I know I'm fishing in clean water. So... Now, since I wrapped, I, since I wrapped backwards last time, you notice I don't always wrap in the same direction. Well, apparently last time I wrapped counterclockwise with the pheasant tail. This time I'm going to have to wrap clockwise. I got to get used to this camera position. Like I said, guys, I'm trying out a different one. If you don't like it, just tell me. I won't do it again. So, wrap back, and now I'm going to grab, now if I were you, I would take your peacock curl, create your body. Like I said, I wanted to do something a little different, I wanted to show you guys something a little bit different. I'm going to grab actually we are going to grab some like I said, you can do some, use some different materials here. Went into my dubbing kit. Oop, grabbed that, grabbed myself some ice dubbing. Some hair's ice in orange. This, by the way, guys, is the most difficult, you know, the most difficult material to get onto a hook or to get onto your thread. And of course, I just did it one-handed without a problem. Somehow I got lucky tonight. Oh, 
Um, depending on where on the Potomac, Ryan, the uh, the Upper Potomac actually is fairly clean. Um, it's not the cleanest river, but it's fairly clean. It's clean enough for stoneflies. They're, um, I mean, you find them in the city of Richmond. Like, a lot of people don't realize that we've got them, uh, that stoneflies actually make it down to the city of Richmond. So, when I say clean, I don't mean like, oh, you can drink that water clean. Um, what I mean is, it's not horribly polluted. So, yeah, I guess I probably should have prefaced that a little bit. But just a cool little fact, if you've ever heard about salmon fly hatch, something that happens out west, everyone talks about it, and everyone, you know, I know a lot of people who think it's the coolest thing ever. Um, we have salmon flies in Virginia, it's the same ones. Um, their range actually goes all the way into the city of Richmond. I'm going to put on, but I'm going to put on this orange hot spot. Why orange? I don't know. I felt like orange. So, a little bit of orange in there. Now, I'm going to grab, and I'm actually going to do a soft hackle tonight. So, soft hackle is a technique that uses specific hackles off of birds. Um, uses the softer fibers, and you're going to want to use, there's, generally it's actually off of game birds. So, Yep, scud, scub dub works just as fine. Um, honestly, guys, any dubbing, I just, because the fact that I've got that in orange, and I want to do it on an orange hot spot because I felt like orange tonight, Um, that's why I did that. So, soft tackles. I guess I'll show you one. Right here. Now, if anybody can tell me what kind of bird this came from, you're good. Or you know that uh, where that I obtain my uh, soft tackle material from. So this is a soft tackle from a game bird, little game bird we have in the state of Virginia. Uh, my dad, my dad, I believe, shot that one for me. Um, but typically you're going to want to use something like a Hungarian partridge. Yeah, it's not a living bird anymore. Sadly, he, um, he's been dead for a little while, too. I'll, I'll be the first one to admit that he's been gone for He's been gone for a bit. So the only reason why I'm doing this tonight is just to show you guys something you can do to your nymphs. Um, definitely, I would say pick up Hungarian Partridge. Um, it's probably the easiest soft tackle in the world to work with. This one, which I haven't mentioned yet what it is, it's probably the most difficult in the world, which is the reason why you never see it get used. This is a bobwhite quail. So, tie it in. Yeah, that ain't though, right? That's not how you want to fish this fly. One thing I forgot to grab. Look, guess I won't have them. Oh, there they are. There they are. I'm gonna make some noise for a second. Somewhere, come on. No, that's not gonna happen. I was trying to grab my uh, hackle pliers. That does make this a little bit easier. So, when we're doing this, we're gonna tie this in. I generally like to do one and a half to two wraps. So, tied it in. I'm gonna put down a couple more turns just to lock it in. Yeah, like I said, this is probably the most difficult bird to deal with. Um, but soft hackles are cool. Soft hackles create as you can tell, it's kind of leggy. I need to turn the fly so I can look at it. Grab the stem, cut off. Be very careful not to cut any more than I absolutely have to. Looks like I did a bit. Then I'm just gonna sit there and take this. Yep, now notice how the barbs are going. They're all going back. So, here's a fun one. For American Tide, and well, actually in reality, Western Tide flies, we want those barbs going back. We want them going back towards the bend of the hook. For Japanese style flies, they actually have them going the other way. It's called, it's called a kabari. Um, super effective. If you ever have seen anything with Tenkara, they always talk about kabaris. Um, kabari is a traditional Tenkara style fly. Cool thing with a kabari is that it kind of creates a little bit of a parachute to hold the fly up. With this, it's gonna sit back. And if you look, these fibers are gonna move in the water to 
create the, they create the look of little legs kind of moving around, which is really cool to me. Um, I love fishing soft tackles. And you can fish these underneath an indicator. You can, you know, do what we call high sticking. So you're kind of tight line nymph them. You can do what's called fishing them as a soft tackle, which you wouldn't use this big of a bead. But if you fish them with, as a soft tackle, you get on a bigger river. I'm going to say this. Most of our brook trap rivers, not many places you can fish a soft tackle. Um, you go to Rose River Farms. Um, Rose River Farm, awesome for soft tackle. You go to, what's the name? Can anybody remember the name of the property the, that the Mormons, that we've gone as Healing Waters a few times? I can't remember the name of that piece of property that we fish. That is some great soft tackle water. So what you want is kind of slow moving water if you're going to fish a soft tackle. But I'm going to sit here and do my little couple of wraps. I bend them around. And that's this fly. So if you notice, I didn't do the back. Yeah, Sugar Hollow Farm. That's the name of the place. Um, it's one of those I'm like, I know it's not Mormon, but I know it's the name of the area. Uh, totally forgotten. But I wanted to do this as a soft tackle tonight. Just as a primer um, for soft tackles, because it is something that, you know, they're awesome to tie. And if you get into tying trout flies, they're a lot of fun. Um, a generic soft tackle is about as simple of, of a fly as it comes. We've got those are going to be coming up in a few weeks, I believe, on uh, the Facebook page, how to tie them. Um, on our Facebook page, every Saturday, I put up uh, fly fishing or fly tying videos. And I've got one scheduled for in a few weeks for how to do soft tackles. But basically, that's the fly. So if you wanted to go ahead and tie these things up, you can tie a million pheasant tails up in a night. Get ready to go out and fish trout. This is one of those flies that, in my opinion, should be in everybody's box. Oop, I did not cut that all the way. You notice? When I was working in the shop and I was getting people started um, in fly fishing and they said they wanted to go trout fishing, first thing I'd always put in their hands is a pheasant tail. Generally, I would do the first style that we did. i do your standard pheasant tail. Bead head, pheasant tail. That's the more basic one. That's the more simple one. That's the one that is, I mean, it, it's deadly. It's the tradition. There's a reason why it's tradition, because it works. This one is a little bit more hot spotty, you know, a little bit more flashy. I mean, it's got, you know, it's got all this pheasant tail. It's got, you know, your soft tackle. And then it's got this orange hot spot in it, which is really cool. Um, an orange hot spot helps to get fish to key in a little bit. So when you, you know, when we talked about, you know, use red wire. Absolutely. Um, red wire, that's kind of a hot spot thing. So, just wanted to be able to show you guys this fly tonight. It's a pretty simple, pretty basic fly. Um, nothing, I hate to say it guys, not a whole lot to it. Um, you know, if you guys want, we can tie up another one. Um, just gotta let me know in the feed. And otherwise, I think, that's a basic one. We'll do one more, I'll start prepping it. Wanna see a more basic one next? Oh, well, I'm going to do it. I want to. I want to type another one because I need more. I need more. I'm actually going to tie one. You know what? I'm going to tie one without a bead. Demonstrate the one without a bead. All right, John. I'm going to demonstrate this one without a bead. Feel free to put a bead on. Um, I will put a little bit of lead wire into this. Because it is a nymph, it's supposed to be down near the bottom. You know, you think about it, these are little baby bugs. And they're just basically crawling around on the bottom. And that's just what they do. I don't know why I did that. I need to put my lead wire on first. See, this is what happens when you don't have a plan. Always have a plan when you're tying. Go in. I don't want to go my 15 thou lead wire. 
There we go. Yep, as Brian said, we're going to be doing uh, teaming up with Virginia Museum of Natural History. Um, cool program that they've got coming up. We're going to be able to tie up some flies. And they talk about the Smith River, but Smith River is just another river in the state of Virginia. So with this fly, one, two, three, four, five, five wraps of lead wire. We're not doing a ton. Can I get my fingers to break that off? No. Now I'm going to put that. You look where I put that. It is basically about a th about an eye length, so where that you can see where it does that downward bend, that's about the eye length. It's about an eye length back. So what that gives me is room to be able to have a head on the fly. It also allows me just to put the weight. You know, it's kind of tradition. Now, so now with this, what I'm doing. If you look, I've, I'm taking my tag in, I'm pulling it over the top of the lead, and my lead just moved on me. Lead, stop moving. There we go. Sometimes you gotta hold it in and tell it where to go. You know, sometimes your lead just won't listen to you. Those are always fun times. Now this is not lead wire. I always refer to it as lead wire because I've been tying for so long and it always was lead wire. Um. So Jonathan, that's actually, I think it's the Museum of Natural History. Brian, am I right on that? I know I'm the one who put it up on uh, Facebook, but I don't remember. That was yesterday. So now we're gonna wrap back. And this time we're gonna put our copper wire. Only to here. You look, what I'm trying to do, I'm kind of trying to create a smooth body. I don't want a big old bump in my body. Pull that back. Now if you look, I pulled off, what, six inches of copper or so? I'm on my third fly with that copper, with that much copper. That's, that's pretty cool. So we're gonna pull off our pheasant. You can hear me rip it, hopefully. Got a few fewer fibers this time, but hey, it happens. Gonna go with a fairly long tail. So, we're gonna try a trick. Spin the bobbin, cord it up. Then, when you go to wrap over the top, what it'll do is it'll cause that material, that thread to jump back just a little bit and help hold you in. Um, one thing, I mean, it's just a quick little spin of the... I'll put a couple more wraps in. Now we're going to wrap back up to that front. This is kind of the fun part of pheasant tails. I did not leave very much pheasant tail. I'm actually going to leave this one. I'm going to do this one about as traditional as I can. Like I said, as I can. So that doesn't mean that it's going to be the most traditional. Come on, get out of the way. I'm trying to remember which way I tied. One wrap of, of copper. Two wraps, and we're gonna call that three. Fine. This is why you hold the fly in there. I'm not making this easy. Someone tells me that that camera was shaking right there. So now 
We're gonna grab our peacock curl. I got three pieces of hurl here. Now, one thing with peacock curl I kind of didn't talk about. There are these tips up here. Oop. Yeah, how short. There are these tips. Those are very brittle, and I usually just break them right off. And I actually, I'll tie in with that, and I'm going to show you kind of what Brian talked about, about wrapping your thread. Tie it in, and then what you can do is actually wrap this around your thread. And what that'll do is that'll help make a little bit more durable of a fly. Nice thing is you pretty much can just, just about break it off right there. Shows how, I mean, this stuff is pretty brittle. It just kind of breaks pretty easily. Now we're going to kind of help create the head a little bit. So if you look, I mean, we've got a pretty basic fly right here. I'm actually going to take the peacock, or not the peacock, the pheasant tail, and pull it over. So one thing, if you notice, I had wrapped back. I'm trying to not crowd the eye of my hook. Um, this is something that, one of the reasons why I like tying bead heads, because it's really hard to crowd the eye of a hook when you've got a bead covering that whole area. But, you know, it is what it is. I like to find ways to make my life easier as a tire. So if you look, we've got a little bit of a wing case. We've got a basic pheasant tail here. Absolutely deadly little pattern. Go on to Suzy Q, go on to um, Mossy Creek, go on to the South River, go on to any of our trout streams. And if you wanted to fish this, I can't guarantee you'll catch fish because I mentioned Mossy Creek and there is no guarantees in Mossy Creek ever, but you've got a really good chance of catching fish if you go out and fish with a pheasant tail. Um, they're really just that deadly. So now I'm just gonna finish up this fly. My whip finish in. So a little fact that used to be true, um, and I'm not sure if it is anymore. I've got a friend who has got connections into Umqua. They are a fly fishing company. They actually are the largest fly tire in the world. Um, mo a large number of flies that you get in fly shops come from Umqua. So he's got connections in there, and he gave me a statistic that blew my mind. In the nymph patterns that Umqua sells. So basically, you know, all of your subsurface trout flies that are not streamers. The pheasant tail and its variants and the hare's ear, which we will be tying coming up. I don't know when. Um, I don't know if Brian and I have decided which one, which one of us gets to tie the hare's ear. Um, the hare's ear and its variants between those two make up something like 45% of all nymphs that are sold in the world, or at least in Umqua's world. Think about that one. Two flies, 45% of all flies, of all nymphs. It's an insane number. Um, so it's a cool fact uh, that my buddy shared with me. But yeah, that's the basic. And they look like I've got a little bit of fuzz on the bottom. There's the basic one. Covered up that top. Now, normally, if you've got epoxy, if you've got some of that light curing epoxy that Brian's used in the past, that's a gr this is a great spot for it um, to cover up this wing case. Because the thing about the wing case is traditionally, or at least on a nymph, it's kind of got almost like a hard, glossy coat over it. So it's a great thing to be able to have. Um, but if you do not have, I'm using Sally Hansen's Hard as Nails, which is what I use for my head cement. If you've got high gloss head cement, if you've got deep penetrating head cement, it doesn't matter. Put it on there. Head cement, 
for this situation, you, you want head cement, high gloss would be better than deep penetrating, but deep penetrating exists. I've been using Sally Hansen's for years. Um, in fact, this bottle is probably six or seven years old. Um, I don't use very much of it, but yep, that is the pheasant tail. That right there is the basic pheasant tail. This right here, if I can get my fingers to be out of the way, the soft tackle pheasant tail. And this right here is a bead head pheasant tail. That's literally, you know, I talked about pheasant tail and its variants. There's three variants right there. You know, pretty basic fly. Get out there, fish it. And uh, hopefully we'll see some pictures of you guys with some fish soon. Um, I don't have any information about us going back because unfortunately they don't tell me anything. I just get to do these live streams. Um, hopefully Brian will be able to tell you something in two weeks. Hopefully we got some information coming. I don't think we do. But I want to say bye, guys. I want to thank everyone for coming out. And uh, everybody have a great night.